This is Friday, February 21st, 2014. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today James C. Foley. Welcome, Jim. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. May I ask when you were born? Yes, uh, July 30th, 1948. And where were you born? In Natick at the Leonard Moss Hospital. And where do you currently live now? Uh, Bellingham, Massachusetts. Marital status? Uh, married to my wife, Carol. And uh, do you have children? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. One son, Chris, and um, also got a girl that we've known since she was about three years old. It's like our daughter, so. Mm -hmm. Any grandchildren? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Patrick Ryan and Maggie Foley of Sudbury, and mm -hmm. Madeline and Olivia and Emma Chabonneau of Menden. Oh, marvelous. <laughs> Okay, so tell us a bit about what Natick was like when you were growing up. Oh, it was a really nice town. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of friends. Uh, it, it's, it's just a really good, good mm -hmm. place to grow up. Now, your father, Francis, <coughs> actually conducted an interview for this project back in 98. Yes. He was a World War II veteran. Correct. And what did he do uh, for a living? Um, after the war, he, um, after World War II, he went to um, went to school, and then he was in the wool business, but that kind of mm -hmm. went down when the wool trade mm -hmm. uh, dried up, so to speak, and then he was a, um, a salesman for trucking companies. Mm -hmm. And how many brothers and sisters do you have? Uh, six. Mm -hmm. Three brothers and three sisters. Okay, so where and when did you enter the military? Um, I entered in July 1st, 1966, and went into the Marine Corps. And why the Marine Corps? <clears throat> well, um, I, had read a, I had read a book about, um, called Battle Cry by Leon Uris. Mm -hmm. um, it was about Marines in the South Pacific. And also I knew the Marine Corps was, um, they were known for their training and mm -hmm. being very good. And um, a couple of my friends from school were going in, so we all decided to go in at the same time. Okay. And why did you join at the time? I wanted adventure. Um, I was not good in school. I did great in the subjects I liked, mm -hmm. but the ones I didn't like, I <laughs> didn't do good at all. Okay. Uh, so I said, my mother signed, reluctantly, my mother signed the papers for me to go in it mm -hmm. before I turned 18. Okay, and where were you sent for basic training? Uh, Paris Island, South Carolina. Tell us what that was like. Uh, it was tough, um, definitely uh, different <laughs> from what you were used to. Mm -hmm. uh, the physical part I was kind of used to because I played sports in high school, mostly football. And so I was used to the physical mm -hmm. part. Um, the discipline, that was also, I didn't mind that. It was, you know, it was good. It was okay. Mm -hmm. It was hard, but it was, but it was okay. When you were sent to South Carolina for basic, was this the first time you were away from home? Yes, pretty much. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was. Yeah. So here you are, 17, 18 years old. Yeah, I was 17. I, I mm -hmm. turned 18 after I was there a month. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was um, different. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> Aside from uh, you were used to the physical part, was there anything else you liked about basic? Um, yeah, I like, I, like I said, I like the discipline, and mm -hmm. I, um, I like the firing range, because I, I hadn't grown up in Natick, and not in the country. I had never mm -hmm. fired a weapon before. I, I really like the weapons. And was there anything you disliked about it? Um, well, the heat is <laughs> very good, the summer mm -hmm. down and the humidity, but that was nothing compared to what I was going to get later on. Mm -hmm. But, um, and not get enough sleep. That, mm -hmm. I mean, I've always been one that needed my sleep. <laughs> and, um, you know, you, you don't get a whole lot of sleep. Mm -hmm. Did you receive advanced or specialized training beyond basic? Uh, yeah. Um, you went to uh, infantry training. Every Marine after boot camp goes to um, infantry training at Camp Geiger, which mm -hmm. was near Camp Lejeune. And then I did get more training in, in weapons because that was my 
my MOS was 0331, which is a machine gun. But you get trained in other weapons, mm -hmm. bazooka and things like that. And how long did that additional training take? Um, yeah, that, was, that was about four weeks, I guess, five weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guessing now, I'm trying to, trying to remember. Mm -hmm. So it was probably four, five, six weeks. Okay, the end of the training, you're now a member of the Marine Corps. What happened next? I uh, came home on leave. Mm -hmm. That was like in uh, October of um, 1966. And I was sent to um, Camp Lejeune to the 8th Marine. Um, to, and from there, went to Cuba, Guantanamo Bay, mm -hmm. for um, about five months. Um, and mm -hmm. there, we. we put time between guard duty and jungle warfare training. Uh -huh. Tell us a bit about the, the warfare training. Uh, well, you'd go out and do maneuvers, you know, mm -hmm. um, war games um, with blanks. And uh, you'd, um, you'd run ambushes and patrols, you know, mm -hmm. things that you were going to be doing when you went, went to Vietnam, but without the live ammunition. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Uh, did you receive any training in case you were captured? Um, yeah, at, at the staging battalion out in California, where mm -hmm. you go before you were sent to Vietnam, yes, there was a, there was a short course on um, what they call escape and evasion, mm -hmm. on what to do. Wow. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to Cuba for a moment. Yeah. Uh, so you were th uh, how long you were there in Cuba again? Um, let's see, January, February, March. About five months. Five months. Of course, Cuba was... Uh, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> it was a big perimeter around the base. And mm -hmm. It was a huge base. And um, at night, we'd go out and be in the, the perimeter, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the lines and the bunkers and minefields and all that they have around. <laughs> uh, um, I imagine it's still the same way because nothing's really changed since... Mm -hmm. um, but it was, parts of it were beautiful. We had a beach near our uh, barracks. You could walk down to the beach, and it mm -hmm. was in the middle of January and February, and it was great. <laughs> well, given the fact that F. Castro had taken over Cuba just a few years right. before. Right. It, 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 was, it was more of a high alert. You, mm -hmm. They're always constantly telling you to be on alert because they're going to try to probe the lot. But the only thing I ever saw blow up was a deer out in the minefield. Ooh. So that was <laughs> Ooh. Or banana rats. They used to come banana rats, these big rats. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get you out to California now. <laughs> <laughs> I came home on leave for mm -hmm. about um, 30 days and then went to staging battalion in um, June of 67. Uh, and where in California uh, was That was Camp Pendleton. Camp Pendleton, okay. And aside from escape and evasion, what the, other training did you was, receive? Uh, um, they call it a staging battalion. Every, every Marine mm -hmm. that was sent to Vietnam would mm -hmm. go there. Um, and I, I can't remember if, there are, if people that had different MOSs or not went through it, but I, all the guys I were with were in the infantry. And you, you did have more infantry training. And mm -hmm. they had mock villages set up. We would go through the village and Mm -hmm. pop up, enemy soldiers would pop up and you had to shoot, you know, your reaction time, things like that. While you were in training, did you receive um, education in the Vietnamese culture? The uh, not really. Not really? No, not, 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 the, not, I didn't anyway. I mean, uh -huh. some, some people might have if, if they were going to be more involved with the, mm -hmm. but I didn't really, really get So, any. aside from learning how to evade capture and whatnot <laughs> in Vietnam. Well, how, how else did you know about Vietnam? Did you read papers? Um, or? Reading the paper. Mm -hmm. um, a few, I can't really remember reading any books about it at that time, mm -hmm. but it was, it was more of articles, newspaper articles, mm -hmm. magazine articles. Um, and at that time, you know, communism was mm -hmm. our number one threat. Um, the domino theory that the Vietnam fell, the rest of 
Asia and Southeast Asia. So it was a different time of the thinking, mm -hmm. well, my way of thinking anyway. You know, I'm doing my part in my country, so. Right. So now is we're around June, July 67? Yep. And uh, after that training, um, went out to Okinawa. Mm -hmm. It was in Okinawa for a few days, and then we, I think we took a, um, a regular commercial airliner from mm -hmm. California to Okinawa. Yeah. And then a couple of days in Okinawa when they were figuring out where we were going to go, what units. And then we took a C-130, one of those um, big cargo planes. Mm -hmm. And the, the, this is kind of funny. Well, it wasn't at the time, but mm -hmm. it was so loaded with, <laughs> with men and and duffel bags that couldn't make it off the runway, the first attempt. So they had us, we went back, taxied around back, and everybody had to take the sea bags out. They didn't take any any of us off. Mm -hmm. And they told us our sea bags would cat, catch up with us. Mm -hmm. So this is, I'm, we're all thinking, you know, we're going to be over water for about eight hours because it's, it's just water between <laughs> Okinawa. And, and, and we, so anyways, the C-130 took off and... We landed, whatever time, eight, nine hours later, whatever, mm -hmm. and um, landed in um, Fubai. And that, is, of course, is Vietnam. Correct. <laughs> or South Vietnam. South Vietnam, right. <laughs> okay. So what was that like, that first time you um, saw Vietnam? I can, I can tell you getting off the, off the plane, it was, and this was in the evening. Mm -hmm. And it was like, Okinawa was hot and humid, but getting off the plane there, it was like um, opening the door of a furnace. It almost took your breath away. It was really stifling. And at the time, what rank did you hold? I was a Lance Corporal Cor for the whole time. Mm -hmm. e, uh, E3. E3, okay. And what you, were you attached to a unit by this yes. time? Uh, mm -hmm. we were sent to um, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines, which at the time was uh, what they were on, what was called Special Landing Force Bravo. The, the our base was a helicopter assault ship. Um, so when we landed in Fubai, helicopters picked us up and brought us out to this ship that was in the South China Sea, a helicopter mm -hmm. assault ship. Um, which was unbelievably crowded. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for, uh, I, I shouldn't say fortunately, because at least it had showers and hot food, but we were not on the ship very long. We'd stay there maybe one or two days and then go do another operation. And the reason f for the Special Landing Force Bravo was that they'd, you'd be on the ship and you could be mobile, go up and down the i -Corps coastline, and they could mm -hmm. send you wherever they needed you. Mm -hmm which was, you know, a lot of times, a lot of places. So out of the whole six months we were on this um, Special Landing Force Bravo, we were probably on the ship about seven days, seven or eight days. Okay, what happened next? <laughs> well, um, well um, I know I always used to think... Um, how I'd react when I, uh, when, when I saw my first dead people. Mm -hmm. um, and I was kind of um, surprised that uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought, maybe but uh, I was there about a week, and um, we were digging in on a hill, and this uh, bright light in the sky, it was probably around 5 o'clock at night, and it was still light, and this big bright light, um, thought it was a flare, but it was a helicopter that had blown up, and they took our platoon out and landed us right next to the uh, smoking wreckage, what was left of it, and we had to go out make a perimeter around it, and it was on the coastal plain. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, you could see for quite a ways. And as you walked out, found old body parts and stuff. That was, um, that was my introduction. 
So it was pretty, uh, pretty intense. <laughs> Undoubtedly. Pretty intense. So tell us a little more about what you would be doing. Um, well, we uh, did search and destroy operation, you mm -hmm. know, looking for um, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Um, and that was our job, mm -hmm. to go um, kill them. <laughs> that was, okay. I can't it's, say it any other that, way. Uh, <laughs> let's, um, I know you, you took part in several operations according yes. to the papers yep. you gave me beforehand. Can you tell us a little more about the operations you participated sure. in? Um, one of the most memorable ones I guess, is, um, it's on the list there, it's uh, mm -hmm. Operation Fortress Century. That was a, um, an operation in the DMZ, um, which, you know, between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. in, um, that was in uh, September of 1967, and it was um, a landing. We did a landing by boat, which was horrible because there was a typhoon in the area a few days before, and the, the water <laughs> was like this. Mm -hmm. People, it was just horrible. People were getting sick in the boats, um, myself included. Mm -hmm. It was awful. Uh, bobbing around in the water for several hours and then you go in, everybody just jumped in the water and got the vomit. Fortunately, there was no <laughs> enemy on the, on the uh, beach where we landed and the weather was so bad, um, we were getting artillery from North Vietnam, but their spotters couldn't really see us because the clouds were so low and the weather was mm -hmm. so bad, so that was the only good thing about the bad weather, but that was horrible. I'll never forget that. Um, and then that operation was um, through, uh, the area actually reminded me of parts of the Cape, the Quaviet River area, Sandy and mm -hmm. um, near the ocean, um, it was raining, just miserable. Um, and that, uh, and our job there was to um, try to stop the North Vietnamese from infiltrating in that area. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see the enemy? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a lot of times you don't. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I did, yeah. Did you feel that the training that you had back in the States paid off? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, Marine Corps training is, is good. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, you react more than think, you know, you, you have to. Um, right. And also, uh, were, were your, was your clothing adequate, um, weapons? Yeah, believe it or not, though, when it, when it rained all that time, you get chilly and cold, you, no matter, even though it was hot. Mm -hmm. uh, at night, if you were wet, it was pretty miserable. Mm. Um, being in the field a lot, um, you don't get the creature comforts of being back at a base and stuff, so, you know, a lot of times you, you're in broaded utilities and it, it was, not fun. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I mean, uh, at night, were you even allowed to like light a fire? Or no, not? not at night. Not, no. out in, mm -hmm. not when you were out on operations, mm -hmm. no. What about the food? Sea rations. Sea rations. But I, once mm -hmm. in a while, if you got to a base, you'd get a hot meal. This was when we were on this special landing list. Right. Mm -hmm. We weren't really had a home base. And uh, yeah, most of the time was sea ration. Mm -hmm. I, I actually lost about uh, 45, 50 pounds in the first few months. I weighed about 190 when I went over there, and I weighed about 140 when I got mm -hmm. back. How about leadership? Were, were, were the commanding officers uh, good? Yeah, um, I'd say most of them were, were good. Uh, two in particular were very good mm -hmm. that I had the honor to serve with. Um, one was... Um, Went on to become commandant of the Marine Corps. Uh, he was Lieutenant Jim Jones. He was mm -hmm. um, first platoon commander. He wasn't my platoon commander, but we did have interaction, into actions together. And uh, he went on to become commandant and um, actually President Obama's um, national security advisor the first two years of the administration. So he he was he was a good leader. And mm -hmm. another one was the best platoon commander I had in the time I was there. Mm -hmm. I had him for about three months. 
um, and unfortunately was killed in uh, April of 1968, mm -hmm. a little while after I left. Uh, John Gates Spindler from mm -hmm. Missouri. He was a um, good leader, um, looked out for the men, and everybody respected him. Uh, on the opposite end of that, I can tell you about uh, <laughs> uh, just some lieutenants when they first get there didn't have the good sense to listen to people who had been there or enlisted men uh, who knew the ropes and consequently they weren't liked very much and there was there was one in particular who um, who uh, didn't listen to anybody and um, fortunately he didn't get anybody else killed he just got himself killed we um, had trapped some um, this was on the same operation operation mm -hmm. fortress Sentry, trapped some North Vietnamese in a um, village and they made tried to make a break for it out to the uh, to some wooded area and um, this guy got up and started running after them which was pretty foolish because it was two helicopter gunships up in support of us and they just shot him up pretty good and he died oh. a few days later but it was his own fault mm -hmm. so you know there was you know some good and some bad bad ones <laughs> While you were out in Vietnam, did you have a chance to write home or receive oh, yeah. letters? Yeah, yeah. And that was very important. Mm -hmm. uh, the helicopters would bring us out mail. That was all we looked forward to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I did, I, mm -hmm. I'd write home. You know, I didn't want to worry people. So right. I didn't tell them everything that <laughs> Quite all right. <laughs> and did you have any other forms of recreation, or were you pretty uh, much out there? Out there, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's um, not really. Not, not when you're in the infantry. Mm -mm. So you told me before the interview that you were actually part of the Tet Offensive. Yes, um, we were. Um, we we were off this special landing force, and we mm -hmm. had a, a base, a fire base. Oh, I don't know, probably twenty miles south of Da Nang, mm -hmm. fifteen twenty miles. We were at a little fire base that we ran patrols in night ambushes and things like that. Mm -hmm out of there and our main objective was to keep the denying air base from getting rocketed because it would always it would be getting rocketed almost every night uh, with those one twenty two millimeter rockets mm -hmm. which were actually kind of pretty to watch come down when they launched mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of awful to say but it was like fireworks um, but that was our main and during that time we lost more guys to to um, mines and booby traps than, than to firefights because um, uh, they were pretty good at uh, sneaking around at night and finding places where to, to mm -hmm. avoid us and, and that's where we were when on um, January 30th I always remember that day and January 31st they were pretty bad mm -hmm. That's where it started. Yeah. Where exactly were you? Um, where? Yeah. Uh, we were just south of Da Nang. That, that yeah, same. Okay, still south of Da Nang. Right. Okay. And um, there was a very large um, number of North Vietnamese who were trying to get to mm -hmm. Da Nang. And um, uh, we were in contact with them, you know, mm -hmm. combat with them right. for, uh -huh. for quite a while, running, running battles for quite a while and that's mm -hmm. uh, when we lost a lot of good guys too. Yeah. Were you um, running machine guns, yes, rifles? Yes, that's what I, I was a machine gun. Okay. Uh, but uh, during then, that time though, I was a machine gun team leader and there was a, um, underneath me there was a machine gunner and a A gunner, the mm -hmm. system gunner. And what kind of machine gun were you using? Uh, M60. M60. And just uh, as a side note, a few years ago I went to a reunion of our unit down in um, Tybee Island, Georgia, and one of the um, one of the activities was a trip to Paris Island to see it. And mm -hmm. there's a museum there, and in the museum they had the M60 machine gun. That made me feel really old. It was in a museum. Mm -hmm. They don't even use it anymore. <laughs> but it was mm -hmm. a great weapon. It mm -hmm. was um, you could drag it through the mud and see it, and it would still work. Mm -hmm. That was good. What more can you tell us about your experiences with the Tet Offensive? Um, 
only that it was, you know, it was a very, like I say, intense time. It was like daily um, action with the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, our company, golf company, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines, was uh, made a ready reaction force, which is you're basically going from one hot spot to another. Mm -hmm. um, so, like I said, it was a very intense time. And it was, look, I think I mentioned it before, lost some really good guys at yeah. that time, guys mm -hmm. that I had been with for six or seven months. And I understand you received a Purple Heart. Yeah, uh, mine was pretty minor compared to what happened. Well, I got shrapnel in the leg just below mm -hmm. the knee. Um, but like I say, it was minor compared to what happened to a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. Tell us, um, how did you get the shrapnel? Uh, I was actually <laughs> sleeping next to my box hall, my fighting hall, and we got mortared, and mm -hmm. I was so tired from um, the day's activity, so to speak, because mm -hmm. you'd be on watch, you'd sleep for two hours, mm -hmm. up for two hours, sleep for two hours. So I was sound asleep. I didn't hear anybody yelling income, incoming. Um, and one landed pretty close. Fortunately, most of it went over my head because mm. I was lying down. Right, uh -huh. And I woke up to a big bang. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I was lucky. I was very mm -hmm. lucky. Definitely. Uh, were you uh, treated in the field? Uh, yeah, because uh, they weren't going to call in a helicopter. For, it, was, it wasn't mm -hmm. that bad. But the next day I did go to an aid station and they took it out. I wish I had kept it. <laughs> but actually, so tell us what uh, the aid station was like. It was just basically like a, at a little fire base with a, a tent mm -hmm. it was, you know, and a corpsman. Mm -hmm. It wasn't um, anything like a triage place or anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So you just treated and yeah, got back? Yeah, uh, they wrapped it up with some bandages and mm -hmm. gave me some antibiotics and I went back to duty. Okay. So overall you were in the operations until when? Uh, actually, on uh, I received word that um, I had to go home because of a family emergency, mm -hmm. and um, this this was right in the middle. <laughs> this was on February like sixteenth, seventeenth, right in the middle of all this stuff going mm -hmm. on, and um, I was uh, brought back to uh, battalion headquarters and told that I was going home because of this family crisis mm -hmm. and um, I probably was one of the few people that left the mm. economy at that time mm -hmm. um, and I was uh, put on a C-141 to Okinawa and I think myself and the crew were, I was the only one on the plane other than, um, other than the coffins that were, you know, it was not good. But, wow. Uh, And yeah. then I came yeah. home. <laughs> Did you land at San Francisco? or uh, Stopped in Okinawa. Okinawa. And then, mm -hmm. then, then to San Francisco, yes. And how'd you get back to Boston? Um, it, it was on a commercial plane. I don't remember mm -hmm. what, what kind it was, but it was, um, it was a very, I don't know, almost surreal mm. to, be, um, to be in this one world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then... Two days later, you're back in the mm -hmm. other world. It, uh, yeah, it was pretty strange. So you're back in Natick toward the spring of 68. Uh, it was um, actually, yeah, at the end of, near the end of February. February 18th oh, okay. was the day again, yep. Okay, so it was late winter 68, right. okay. A family emergency. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, were you formally discharged or? I uh, was um, still technically in the Marine Corps, and that they understood the situation. Mm -hmm. And I actually um, just went to work right away, started working right away. And where did you work? I worked for a construction company. And mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine, who was also in the Marine Corps, his father was uh, in construction, and he got me a job with a, with a company. Okay, so here you are, back in Natick, yep. late winter 68, and did you ever um, see any war protesters or? Yeah, yeah, I didn't like them. <laughs> you didn't like them? No. Uh -huh. I could understand it. I could understand it, but mm 
part of me was just, uh, you know, there's still guys over there. Right. Uh, uh, were you a member of the Marine Corps Reserves? Or? No. No, you were just still technically? Right, but they, they understood my situation, mm -hmm. and I ended up getting dis honorably discharged. Yeah. Uh, it's mm -hmm. in the papers on um, right. May of 1968. Very interesting two years. <laughs> <laughs> Very, yeah. <laughs> after Aged about fifty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, after um, after you left the court, did you join any military organizations? Um, not right away. Not right away. Um, but um, I did end up joining the DAV, Disabled American Veteran. Mm -hmm. And after the advent of the internet, I discovered mm -hmm. um, my old unit mm -hmm. had a website and reunion. And so I joined that, the, the Second Battalion, Third Marines, Vietnam Veterans Association. Okay. And the, uh, did you ever take advantage of the GI Bill? No, I should have. Um, but I how didn't. about <laughs> any other medical benefits? Yeah, I, I'm mm -hmm. in the VA healthcare system. Um, I had a few. Um, you know, fifth thing service connected from the shrapnel wounds, so I, I right. mm -hmm. use the VA for that. Yeah. Now, as far as being a Vietnam veteran, and I've, I've spoken to other Vietnam veterans, and they're pretty universal in saying that the treatment they received after their service uh, wasn't exactly fair. How about you? Yeah, well, I, I, I never had anybody come up and tell me, you know, um, baby killer or mm -hmm. things like that. I never had any experience like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I do know, you know, you didn't get the, the respect or the feeling you get that like mm -hmm. veterans get today, which is absolutely the way it should be. Mm -hmm. No matter what your politics or what you're thinking are, it's the men mm -hmm. and women who, in the armed services, if we don't have a a strong military, we're, uh, we're pretty much screwed as a country. So. Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, it wasn't like that back then. Mm -hmm. My and family was great, I, mm -hmm. I, but um, other than that. Yeah. So you also had two brothers who, yeah. who, took, who took part. Uh, uh, Danny. Danny. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Vietnam. Um, he was in, in the Marine Corps also when I came home, and he, he went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He was in the 7th Marine. And then um, Paul, mm -hmm. who you know well, <laughs> he uh, he went into the um, Navy yep. and had a long, great career as a CB. And mm -hmm. um, he went into 1979. I can remember that. I remember the the going away party for him. Your sister Jeannie was there, and <laughs> yeah. a lot of the mm -hmm. Sullivans. Mm -hmm. Maybe you were there. I don't remember. <laughs> don't, re don't quite remember that one. I but remember, anyway, I remember that. Yeah. So, uh, Jim, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Oh, looking back, I think it was very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I'm glad I did. I mean, <laughs> not all of it was good, but... Right. Um, yeah, no, I know. I, I'm proud of what I did. I'm uh -huh. glad I went. And, yeah, no, I think it was good. Did either um, your son or daughter uh, were, did they ever consider the military? Uh, actually, my son, after his first year of college, he was in college and he wanted to quit college and join the Marine Corps and go because of the Gulf War. And I said, mm -hmm. no, you're not doing it. <laughs> said, I'm paying for college right now. Stay in college. When you get mm -hmm. out of college, if you still want to go, you can. So I. Did he? Uh, he stayed in college. Stayed yes. in college. <laughs> But he's also, he's been very supportive of, he's very interested in my military time and everything. Mm -hmm. He's been to a couple of the reunions with me. Okay. And I'm going to um, have you hold this up. This was, tell us a little bit about this book. Um, this is a book, uh, The Nature of the Beast, that was written by Chuck Ketterman, who mm -hmm. served in the uh, Golf Company, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines, the same time frame as I did. And um, he actually put together a pretty good book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, about our time there and what we did. And, mm -hmm. so. and you're mentioned in there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also pictures. Yeah, a few pictures. And um, uh, 
Yeah, it's, it, it's pretty good. It's, um, mm -hmm. pretty and when good. was that published? 2004. And still available? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Just have somebody check on Amazon. Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chuck Ketterman will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's got some good reviews. So. Yeah. Jim, uh, is there anything else you'd like to mention about your time in Vietnam or uh, uh, your opinion about serving in the military? Um, no, you know, I think uh, one, one thing I'd like to say is uh, just to hope, wish everybody would just remember the families of the guys that didn't come back. That's mm -hmm. who... Um, that's who suffers the most, mm -hmm. you know, the, the families of the guys that didn't come back. Um, and i um, just like to thank my brothers and sisters. Um, mm -hmm. It was nice to see them when I got home. My, I didn't know my wife yet, I didn't, so i got to mm -hmm. mention her. <laughs> but I didn't know her yet, so... I, right, that's okay. <laughs> but, um, no, that's about it. Okay. Well, James C. Foley, we thank you so <laughs> much oh. for taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project and adding a story to your father's. Well, thank you very much okay. for what you do, and okay. thanks for having thank me you. here. Mm -hmm.